that we can gather and praise your name. We can gather with friends and family and shout your purposes. Dear God, we, we thank you that we can come to you humbly, setting everything of this week aside. And that you take it. Dear God, as we, as we come and bring our offerings and gifts to you, we just ask that you would bless them and multiply them to grow your kingdom, to grow your word outside of this congregation and into the community and draw Cairo closer to you.
they step down would you thank them uh, it's funny some of the things that happened during worship I, I was down there on the on the front row things sound a little bit different than they do back there and uh, all of a sudden I found a harmony line to uh, sing along with uh, Ashley and I thought I said it wonderful and then I realized I was actually hearing Alex sing the harmony line it was him that sounded good and not me Would somebody lock him up in his box? <laughs> you come on out. Yeah, you come on out. <clears throat> Today we continue on. This is the second week of the message series called Unfinished Business. And uh, basically what we're doing is it's a three-month journey through uh, the essential truths that are outlined in the, books, in the book of Acts, which is written by... Come on, people. Who was here last week? Uh, it's written by Luke, uh, the same person that wrote the Gospel of Luke, and then he continues on. And so in the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, Luke talks about what it was like to walk alongside Jesus and to carry on the mission and ministry alongside of him. And he continues on in the book of Acts, and he talks about how the apostles, how the early church functioned and the things that they did along the way. And... Um, uh, he, and he does that, this will be on your next steps if you want to uh, go ahead and get a head start on that. He does that because he wants to, he gives a very precise, accurate account of Jesus, who he was and what he did. And uh, he, he goes on into the book of Acts because he wants the Spirit of Christ to be alive, present, alive, and well in the church. Not only the early church at that time, but also... Uh, in, in the church today. And he writes the book to Theophilus, which means lover of God, Theoph Theophilus, lover of God, and uh, who may or may not have been an actual person, but rather the book written to Theophilus, lovers of God. The book was a gift to us, just as his Gospel of Luke uh, also was written. But then, uh, at the end of the book of Acts, it ends very abruptly. There's no nice, uh, okay, and now we're closing out the book, or I'll see you later kind of a thing, like a lot of the, the uh, uh, especially the New Testament books end. But it doesn't. It ends rather abruptly, and the reason for that is, is, is to remind us that the mission and ministry that was carried on by Jesus Christ and, and then by the apostles and in the earlier church that we have some unfinished business. There are some things. Those things need to continue on through the mission and ministry of the church. Well, how do we do that? And today we're going to find out exactly how as we get into one of the most exciting chapters in the entire Bible, uh, the second chapter of Acts. Okay? And so that's where, that's where we're going to be uh, looking today as they receive the gift, as they receive the power, as they uh, receive the gift of the... Holy Spirit, all right? That's, that's where we find uh, the, the account of Pentecost in the second chapter. And basically what I've done is I've diced it up into uh, verses 1 through 6, uh, Acts 2, verses 1 through 6. That's where the believers are gathered in one place, and they're praying. And at the time that they're gathered there together and they're praying, something miraculous happens, absolutely miraculous. There, there's a sound of a violent wind blowing. And uh, in next steps, I ask, you know, uh, how, would you, how would you react if, if we're sitting here and all of a sudden you hear a violent wind blowing? What's interesting is uh, in the Greek and the Hebrew, um, the word that, that for spirit translates into wind. Okay, so they hear the rushing violent wind or the spirit coming upon them. As they looked around at one another, they could see tongues of fire uh, as if they were resting on the heads of people. And goodness gracious, how I would love to look out and see, and sometimes I do, on some of you, 
I see how there's little aha moments when God's speaking. We had one. We had some of those in uh, in youth Sunday night, didn't we? It's several aha. Mo- yeah, it was awesome. Epiphanies, yeah, epiphanies. Um, uh, but so as the tongues of fire came uh, and rested upon their heads, and then they started to speak uh, in other tongues. They started speaking. And so the crowds gathered because they were bewildered at these Galileans that were there, and they were speaking in the language of the person that's hearing. So the the person that's hearing and gathering, and they can't figure out how in the world is this even happening. So the next section that I want to look at was Acts uh, 2, verses uh, 12 through 18. And that's where Peter stands up with the other 11. And as he's standing there, he starts to preach. And I'm not talking about, you know, uh, all the way through the Gospels, Peter, if there was anybody that was going to show up and say something and then think, that was Peter, okay? <clears throat> he didn't hold back. Well, Peter started to preach in a manner that was unlike even beyond Peter's rag- regular boldness. He, he was just putting it out there. And he said, basically, this pouring out of the Spirit is just like what the prophet Joel had said in the Old Testament. You understand who he's talking to? These people knew of the Old Testament, of of Joel's prophecy, uh, of what was to be, that the Spirit would be poured, uh, poured out. And Peter says, this is what's happening. And so here in the book of Acts, we see that bridge from the Old Testament into the early church all the way into the church uh, today. And so now... We're going to get into the, these next two parts, or the parts that I really want to highlight. This is the first segment, and uh, Matthew will put it up on the screen. Uh, Acts 2, verses 37 through 41. We'll be going through 47 eventually. When the people heard this, uh, I'm reading out of the uh, NRSD, New Revised Standard Version. Uh, when, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, he pleaded with them, Save yourself from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So what's interesting, if if you've been walking on even the past message series, where did they feel it? It says they were cut to the heart. Where they felt it, where they received it, was the heart, which was the center of it all, where all of those things, all the issues of life, flowed from. So they asked the question, how is it that we make it right? Uh, in other words, we're living, living this way. How can we make things better? And, of course, he tells them to repent. And uh, uh, I've always taught it as a military term. You're marching this way, and if you are to repent, that means that you turn around. Uh, I actually looked, and uh, the the translation of repent means to change one's mind. To change one's mind. So if you if you want to receive this gift, change your mind. Turn around for those things that that you're doing. And he says, uh, be baptized. So this whole whole idea of believing, uh, repenting, being baptized, and then this gift of the Holy Spirit is given to to them. You know that gut punch moment? Uh, Brian and I talked about that uh, well, several times over the past few weeks, those, those, uh, that day of reckoning that he's speaking to me. So he starts crying out to him, save yourself, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Was he speaking to him then or is he speaking to us now? Yes. He, he, save yourself from this corrupt generation and all those things. And he tells them, it can be different. You can be transformed. Is he talking to them or is he talking to us? Yes. But somehow, I like to say, well, he was talking to them. You know, you get them, Peter. You take care of business with them. 
But he, he's speaking to us. And so here I want to finish it out with the next part of that text, which is uh, Acts 2, and it's uh, verses 42 through 47. So um, you got it up, Matthew? <coughs> they devoted themselves to the apostles. Okay, you understand. Believe, repent, baptize, receive the Holy Spirit, right? Okay. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and, and uh, the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and they ate their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And so these new Christians, what was going on after they did those, after they did those things, uh, they were being transformed and they were understanding that they had, they were having a new purpose. They had a reason to live. They had an understanding of what it was that they were supposed to do. And they, they found themselves uh, being, uh, they were devoting themselves to several acts of, of what it is that, that we are called to do in the church, those spiritual disciplines. If you're looking at your next steps, you can go down about six different, uh, six little bullets there. And I actually listed off those that we, we had talked about over the past few weeks. But they find themselves, and they've committed themselves to the apostles' teaching, doing what they were instructed to do. See, we don't just come and hear. After we hear, we're supposed to go and do. And so, and then they would fellowship with one another. And then they found themselves, they would share their possessions with one another if there were anyone that was in need. And generosity, because of this, what ended up flowing out of it was generosity. You can't receive the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, and then sit back going, mine, mine, mine. Can you? Maybe I need Della back over here. <laughs> this would have been a good intro. But, but basically what they ended up, and, and then they would come and they would worship and they would pray together, and miraculous things were done, right? before their very eyes. Now, wouldn't that be awesome? See, because I see those miracles. Because of your generosity. You hear me, don't you, Megan? Megan, in her new ministry, she was in a ministry called Teaching. Now she's in a new ministry, and you see those miracles happening over and over and over. And those things aren't possible if we don't come uh, together uh, being powered by the old by the Holy Spirit. And ultimately, after that ended up happening, uh, the, the outflow of that was the Lord added to their numbers daily, over and over. People were being transformed, and then this transformation begins with me. It begins with you. And then you start sharing those things with someone who turns around and shares with someone. And then uh, this whole mission and ministry that Jesus started, that he that the apostles carried on, that the early church carried on, it continues on being carried out by the church. Not just here, but all over, uh, all everywhere where, gather, where believers gather together to take care of this unfinished business that was uh, laid out in the gospel. Now, I'll tell you, ready? This fall, churches all over the South all over the nation are going to be gathering together for their annual meetings. And the very first thing that happens is they look and say, how many people did we have last year at this time, their fiscal year? How many people did we have? And then they look at how many people died, and they take that number off. And then they look at how many new people did we have to come in? How many new converts? How many people were brought in? Uh, the, do y'all see the heater back there in the baptismal pool? Um, we are blessed to have a facility here uh, that has a baptistry 
the, uh, the Nazarene church uh, does not have a baptistry, and they will be here tonight to have a baptism service, and uh, we are fortunate enough to offer them the use of the building at 1400. Okay? You understand? Isn't that awesome? And so, and 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 you know, the call came is, would y'all possibly be willing? Would we? Can I come? And so, so as um, uh, as this uh, this as people are baptized, but in these church meetings, there's tons of churches that will sit here this fall and say we had zero growth, we had no one to come to an understanding of and say that they would follow Jesus Christ, you added 35 people over the... And a lot of those were through baptism. I've been up there a lot. I could go again. But, but, but we, we, we've done that. But, but my question is, the, the, the churches that have no converts, that have no growth, that, that their, their death rate is, is uh, outgrowing their birth rate, if you will, why? I fully believe that, that the Holy Spirit is not being listened to and followed through with, with the directions. Now, do you understand? Matthew, uh, I'm sorry, you're not even Matthew. Thomas, would you put up the first graphic? A lot of times I feel like we're, we're like that, all right? A balloon. Uh, uh, and we love to get a balloon as a child, but right there, that, that thing right there is useless. It's flat. Uh, it's got no power. It's dead. Until something happens. And just like Jesus in the, in the Old Testament, uh, in the New Testament times where Jesus came and he would breathe on them the breath of life, he would breathe spirit into them. Put it out there. And so then, all of a sudden, you know what that is? A dead balloon. That right there is a dead balloon. It's been filled up with something in it, but it has no power. The only way that that thing has any power is when the power is released. That thing would sit there all on its own, but yet when the power is released, it's going somewhere. And I, I told Kathy, I almost did this today. Uh, I, working with kids for years, I almost blew it up. But yeah, I know, you know, when I blow into it, there's going to be spit, and she'd freak out if it flew her way. So if, but if I let it go, if I blow that thing up and I let it go, where's it going to go? Where? Yeah, you don't know. You, it would make a beeline toward Kathy because she'd be the one that would freak out. <coughs> germs, germs, germs. But, but I guarantee you it's going to move. It's going to go somewhere, but we don't know where it's going to go. God did not give us the power of the Holy Spirit and did not fill us with the Holy Spirit so that we could be cowered down behind locked doors in fear. For us to walk around like a bunch of puffed up balloons, look at me, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. He does that so that you can be released and go out into the world, go out and take care of business, but that's a scary proposition. Why? I don't know where I'm going. And some of us like little check marks, don't we, man? Heather, looking at you. Some of us like, no, this is what I'm going to do today. Bam, 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 bam. And then you find yourself, I'm over here. What am I doing over here? Well, that you're doing, I guarantee you're being driven by the Holy Spirit. If He is the one that's guiding you, you're not going to end up somewhere that you should not be. Did you hear me? Or if you find yourself and you're in a scary situation, ever been there? you got to remember he took you there and that he's going to protect you and guide you through whatever that is. Now, the problem is that after we've done that, what do we end up looking like? We're flat again. See, all that power has been released, and so we end up being flat again. Can't do anything. Now, <clears throat> in some ways we're like that, but in other ways we're not because Jesus told us 
that we would never be without the Spirit. We would never be without that power. But all the way through the, the uh, New Testament, we find the disciples being filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit again and then again and again. And what they do is they end up coming back to the filling station whether it be worship gathered here or it, during a prayer time, and then what ends up happening when they gather. That's y'all. That's the church. We've gathered here in worship. Now it's time to go and be the church, and, and then that's released. But in, in but we don't gather here just to say, okay, got that off my list. I've been to church, and no. With, with it in you, without going out and releasing it, you haven't done anything. You're dead. It's not until that we're willing to let go, let, let release that which is within us. Being able to come and... And once again be transformed. Once again be empowered to go and do that thing. I was baptized. I did receive, so I'm good. No, we've got to keep coming back to the filling station and coming back and, and encouraging others to do the same thing. I, I almost put a question on the, uh, on the next steps for you to ponder, but I backed off but I'm going to toss it out anyway. Do we need another Pentecost? And the answer is no. It's already given. All we have to do is remember that it was done, that we were given the power, and then let's go and remember that thing. Right? Maybe personally we need to have another Pentecost. We need to acknowledge that it's already been, been done, and we need to come and be willing to be filled and be, well, Well, if he fills me up, I don't know where. I may find myself in Germany. I may find myself in Uganda. Lord, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for loving us the way that you do. We thank you so much for the infilling. As we come in worship and we come in praise and we come in fellowship with one another and you fill us up, let us not be sitting here just thankful that we're filled up. We leave this place transformed, but we leave it. You didn't ask us to come and stay here and just be here. You sent us out. Give us that boldness that Peter preached with. Let that be what guides us. And if we end up here or if we end up there, if, if we end up at the hospital visiting someone, let us speak with the boldness, with the courage of saying, may God place His healing hand exactly where He needs to go. See, because if it's me, I'm going to say, get up out of that bed and walk. But there may be a reason at that moment for us to wait. Give us the courage to wait on you without losing faith. No matter what the trials are in our life, no matter what situation you bring us to, let us walk knowing that we're daughters and sons of the Most High God, and as such... We can raise our heads and, 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 and walk in that assuredness that we are transformed people because we have relationship with you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us learn as a church how to take care of this unfinished business. Put a passion in our heart that calls us back next week to learn even more and more about what shall we do. Let us be a people of action, not of our own doing, but how you would want us to act. Teach us how, how that we can be a generous giver with the reality of sometimes I've got bills that I've got to pay. 
Teach us how to be cheerful givers so that we can have the resources, that we can be able to go out and uh, we touch people all around this world. But you know that there's so much more that we could do. Father, I truly do ask, pour out your spirit and let us not be so self-centered that we try to keep it to ourselves. We pray these things in the blessed and holy name of Jesus. Amen. The altar this morning is wide open. <clears throat> Some of you have that uh, stuff that you didn't want to talk about, just like I do. Come, the altar's here. Ask Him to direct you. Ask Him, where is it that you would take me? Come on up, Jim. This is, it's wide open. If you want somebody to pray with you, a little uplifted hand, and somebody in this church, somebody in this fellowship will come and pray with you. It may not be me. Somebody will. If you want to be left alone, like I often do, keep this hand there. And we'll try to respect that. Some of you have been walking with us for a while, and it's time. For, uh, Karen has forms down here. You just come and you give some basic information. and say, you know what? Uh, uh, we don't have members. We have partners in ministry. Each one of us are called to ministry. And so you come and you partner with these people, and uh, uh, we would gladly receive you in. Maybe some of you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you want to come and say, you know what? Uh, I don't know where he's going to leave me, but I'll go. And, uh, is, and I would love for you to come and find me and tell me that. And we've already got water back. Come as he directs you.
thing we need to uh, deal with. Uh, the Nazarene Church is coming in tonight, so if you would, kind of clean up after yourself uh, so that cleaning crew won't have to uh, deal with that uh, this afternoon. But we just If there are any papers or uh, tissues that you just you can pick those up, take them out. But anyway, we've gathered here in worship. Now it's time to go and be the church. Amen. <laughs> 